Between 1978 and 2001, at least 65 women disappeared from Vancouver's downtown east side. Robert Picton, responsible for making Canadian women disappear for years, and what horrors were found on his pig farm. Welcome or welcome back to True Stories, join our family in exploring some of the most twisted true crime cases. As always, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. Robert William Willie Picton, born 1949 was raised on a family-operated pig farm in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia. Picton and his siblings sold most of the property for urban development, reducing the farm to 6.5 hectares. Picton maintained a small-scale livestock operation at the farm. He also received a share of the proceeds from the real estate transactions and was a partner with his brother, David, in a salvage company. Picton was a socially awkward man who was known to have exhibited strange behaviors. He lived alone in a trailer home on the farm. In 1996, the Picton brothers started the Piggy's Palace Good Times Society. It was a federally registered charity with an alleged mandate to raise funds for service organizations through events such as dances and shows. Neighbors complained of rowdiness, drug use, drunkenness and noise. The parties were attended by as many as 1,700 people, including bikers and sex trade workers from the downtown east side. In 2000, the city of Port Coquitlam shut Piggy's Palace down. Picton became familiar with the downtown east side through visits to a rendering plant located there, where he disposed of waste animal parts. He would cruise the 10-block strip called the Low Track, offer women money and drugs, and often take them back to his farm. In 1978, a joint RCMP Vancouver Police Department Missing Women Task Force began compiling a list of missing women. The earliest case on the list connected to Picton was that of Diana Melnick, last seen on 22 December 1995. Because of the marginalized lifestyles and transient habits of the victims and other people in the downtown east side, disappearances often went unnoticed. The disappearance of Sherry Rail, who vanished in 1984, was not reported for three years. In 1987, the RCMP set up a special team to investigate the unsolved murders and disappearances of sex trade workers, it was disbanded in 1989 due to limited progress. Over the years, as the rate of disappearances escalated, rumors of a serial killer began to circulate in the downtown east side. Sex trade workers began walking the low track in groups and writing down the license plate numbers of cars that picked women up. But the disappearances continued. In 1991, the families of missing women, along with advocates for sex trade workers, established an annual Valentine's Day Remembrance Walk as a memorial to murdered and missing victims. They demanded a thorough investigation, but the police response was sluggish. The Vancouver police refused to say that a serial killer was at work or even consider that the missing women were dead. There were no bodies to warrant an investigation that would be a strain on police resources. To police, it seemed reasonable to presume that some of the women had moved away and others had died from drug overdoses. On 22 March 1997, a woman Picton had taken to his farm for it back when he tried to handcuff her. She seized a kitchen knife, and in the ensuing struggle, both received serious stab wounds. The woman ran to the road and waved down a car whose occupants called an ambulance. She was taken to Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster. While the woman was undergoing emergency surgery, Picton was receiving treatment for his injuries in the same hospital. An orderly found a key in his pocket that fit the handcuffs on the woman's wrist. Picton was arrested and charged with attempted murder, assault with a weapon, and forcible confinement. The charges were stayed and eventually dropped because the woman, whose name was placed under the protection of a publication ban by the courts, was not considered a competent witness due to drug addiction. Picton claimed she was a hitchhiker who had attacked him. In the spring of 1999, an informant told the Vancouver police that a single mother and drug addict named Lynn Ellingson had seen a woman's body hanging in Picton's slaughterhouse. When questioned by police, Ellingson initially denied the story. Only much later did she admit that on 20 March she had in fact seen the body. She did not report it because she feared Picton and depended on him for money for drugs. 
In 2001, the Vancouver police and the RCMP formed Project Evenhanded, a joint task force to investigate the missing women from the downtown east side. In early February 2002, Scott Chubb, formerly employed by the Picton family as a truck driver, informed the RCMP in Port Coquitlam that he had personally seen illegal guns in Picton's trailer home. That information met the official requirement for a search warrant. On 5 February, officers of the task force raided the pig farm. In addition to several illegal and unregistered guns, they found items connecting missing women to the property. Picton was arrested on weapons charges and then released on bail. He was kept under surveillance and was not permitted to return to the pig farm while police conducted a thorough search under a second warrant. Among the evidence they discovered were handcuffs, women's clothing and shoes, jewelry, and an asthma inhaler prescribed to Serena Abbotsway, one of the missing women. DNA testing of blood found in a motorhome on the property proved to be that of Mona Wilson. On 22 February 2002, Picton was rearrested and charged with two counts of murder. A total of 26 murder charges were eventually laid against him. While Picton was being held in jail in Surrey, British Columbia, he shared a cell with an undercover RCMP officer he believed to be another detainee. In their conversation, Picton said he had murdered 49 women and had wanted to make it 50. Picton's preliminary hearing to decide if there was enough evidence for trial lasted from January to July 2003. Due to the unprecedented volume and complexity of legal issues that had to be litigated, his trial on the first six charges did not begin until 22 January 2007 in New Westminster. On 9 December 2007, Picton was found guilty by a jury on six counts of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in a federal penitentiary with no possibility of parole for 25 years. Those convictions were upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2010. We've come to the end, thank you for watching. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Till next time.